Hello and welcome to the Complete History of Science. Series 4, Episode 4, The University. In the late 11th century, Europe underwent a remarkable transformation. An unprecedented population boom greatly expanded the continent's cities, and hundreds of new towns sprang up. This rapid growth coincided with a revived economy, which improved the material conditions of all segments of society. A new class of rich merchants and bankers emerged, expanding trade across the continent, and it's estimated that by the end of the 12th century, the level of commerce in Europe had surpassed that at the height of the Roman Empire. There were several reasons for Europe's increased prosperity at this time. Partly, it was due to an increased food supply, itself a consequence of technological innovation. The heavy plough, drawn by horses, began to replace the ox-drawn plough. Likewise, the older two-field crop rotation system was replaced by a three-field system, which resulted in greater crop yields year on year. This was further assisted by changes in climate, as Europe entered what is known as the medieval warm period. In addition to improved food supply, Europe experienced a period of increased security, as the frequency of Viking, Arab and Magyar raids decreased. The Vikings in particular became integrated into the European feudal system, and Norman lords brought peace and stability to Normandy, but also England, Sicily, Italy and Spain. This prosperous, secure and expanded Europe invigorated urban life and spurred the rise of a new distinctly European type of institution, the university. Prior to the development of the university, Schools based around cathedrals and monasteries had predominated. However, as the number of educated men expanded, many students saw education outside the remit of an official school. Students pursued the best masters, and likewise, masters needed to attract enough students in order to earn a living. Since these masters were no longer tied to a particular school, they could move from city to city and would often find themselves as foreigners. The downside of this new freedom was that masters were often powerless compared to the civil and church authorities with whom they had to deal. In response, independent masters formed collectives known as universitas to negotiate teaching rights and conditions. These universitas, or universities, weren't necessarily tied to any particular site or building, but were instead collections of students and masters who formed a legally self-governing association. Secular and church authorities sought to encourage the growth of these new bodies, granting them jurisdiction over their internal affairs and the right to negotiate with external authorities. In addition, members of the universities were usually not subject to local civil law, but instead had clerical status. This meant they were part of the church's hierarchy, though it didn't imply any particular religious or social role. Instead, it was a legal privilege, which allowed members to be tried by ecclesiastical courts rather than secular ones. In practice, this frequently meant that students or masters who broke the law were treated more leniently, a source of much friction between members of the universities and local townspeople. It's difficult to date the exact birth of the university, but what is known for sure is that by 1200, universities had formed in Bologna, Paris and Oxford. At Bologna, the earliest of these institutions, law was the central course of study. Another early university, Salerno, came to specialise in medicine. However, more important in the development of science were the universities of Paris and Oxford. At these institutions, the university was organised into faculties of theology, law, medicine, and the largest, known as the arts. The arts faculty took its name from the liberal arts of the medieval curriculum, but during the 13th century, the arts faculty instead became the home of natural philosophy. 
Whereas previously, natural philosophy only formed a sliver of the curriculum, it was now the cornerstone of the whole educational system. This was largely a consequence of Aristotle's translated works becoming available, which caused a huge shift in medieval European intellectual life. The impact of Aristotle's work, as well as that of his commentators, was monumental, and his work became central to the new curriculum. This was especially important, as all students had to pass through the university's arts faculty. To enter the higher faculties of medicine, law or theology, it was first necessary to acquire a degree in the arts. It's also true that during this early period, most students left university within the first two years without obtaining any degree whatsoever, so natural philosophy may have been their entire university experience. The impact of this structure was far-reaching, as it meant that all learned men were now exposed to several years of instruction in natural philosophy. Teaching in the arts faculty was split into two types of instruction, the lecture and the disputation. Lectures usually took place in the morning, and their purpose was to present texts to students. Although the translation movement had made copies of ancient works available, they were still rare enough that reading texts aloud was a necessary part of disseminating these works. Initially, these lectures mainly consisted of a master reading these works, but later they would give more commentary and opinion. During these lectures, students were mostly passive, simply listening and taking notes. However, this was not the case in disputations. Here, students were expected to apply what they had learned in the lecture hall to the disputed question proposed by a master. Usually, two contradictory answers were presented, and students and masters argued using rigorous logic for or against these proposed answers. The disputations were critical for introducing a culture of criticism into the medieval university where knowledge was supposed to derive from reasoned argument, rather than appeals to authority. Members of the arts faculty began to see themselves as philosophers, and mastering Aristotle's treatment of nature was their primary motivation. The tools of this new study were reason and experience, approaches which were open to everyone, and hence the writings of non-Christians were also accepted on equal footing. The traditional justification of natural philosophy as a tool to better understand the Bible began to become strained, and many masters began to see the study of nature as an end in itself. This new atmosphere, perhaps inevitably, led to a clash with authorities beyond the university's walls. These tensions must have existed at all universities, but it became most pronounced at Paris. Paris was perhaps the most prestigious university in the world at the beginning of the 13th century, with a large arts and theology faculty, and it attracted students from across Europe. Nevertheless, in contrast to other universities, the adoption of Aristotle appears to have been a more complex process. In 1210, the Council of Bishops responsible for Paris issued a decree banning the teaching of Aristotle in the arts faculty. The ban was renewed in 1215, and in 1231, Pope Gregory IX mandated the banning of certain of Aristotle's books until they could be examined and purged of error. However, it appears that the committee appointed by the Pope never completed this task and failed to submit any materials which were to be banned. Indeed, by the 1240s-1250s, it seems that Aristotle was not only being taught, but fully embraced across the university. In 1255, a list of texts taught at the university shows that all of Aristotle's known works were fully available. By the 1270s, a new phase of this struggle opened up, where conservatives from the theology faculty sought to impose limits on the teaching of Aristotle. 
In 1270 and 1277, the Bishop of Paris, Etienne Tempier, issued two condemnations, targeting certain propositions which were apparently being taught in the arts faculty. The main issues were Aristotle's views on the eternity of the universe and the nature of the soul, which were seen to undermine Christian doctrine. Masters of arts were forced to swear an oath that they would avoid theological questions, and if this was unavoidable, to resolve them in favour of faith. University members who taught any of the condemned doctrines risked being excommunicated. Despite these events, the new enthusiasm for Aristotle could not be dimmed. At Oxford, no such bans existed, and scholars were free to teach and debate as they pleased. Even in Paris, only limited parts of Aristotle were banned, and most teaching carried on as normal, with the bans eventually rescinded by 1325. The tensions did not evaporate, but a new generation of churchmen, keenly aware of Aristotle's utility, sought to harmonise his natural philosophy with Christian doctrine, rather than eradicate it. The most successful of these churchmen was Thomas Aquinas, who set out to define the relationship between faith and reason. Aquinas was a keen advocate of Aristotle's philosophy, and his fame rests largely on his attempts to reconcile difficult aspects of Aristotle's philosophy with the Christian faith. Aquinas was comfortable with philosophy, believing that if it was pursued correctly, it was incapable of producing results which contradicted faith. However, he also placed limits on its use. To illustrate this, it's once again useful to look at the old thorny issue of creation. Aristotle had, contrary to the story in Genesis, argued that the world must be eternal. This had long been contentious amongst Christian leaders and had previously been attacked by Christian philosophers such as John Philoponus. John believed it was possible to use philosophy to show the absurdity of Aristotle's claim and reaffirm faith. He argued that an eternal universe would necessarily stretch back in time an infinite amount. However, John argued this was ridiculous. How could an infinite extent of time possibly elapse? Aquinas, on the other hand, doesn't make his own argument for creation or eternity. Instead, he made the more nuanced argument that questions of this nature cannot be proved by reason alone. He argued that the moment of creation exists outside of space and time, and hence it's not susceptible to arguments from reason. Aquinas wasn't attempting to discredit philosophy, but only set limits on where it might yield interesting results. Aquinas himself held positions in the Faculty of Arts at both Paris and Naples, while also being a member of the Dominican Order. He had, like many men who would contribute to science in the medieval world, a foot in both worlds. His arguments were initially controversial, but eventually largely accepted by the Catholic Church, and he was canonised quickly after his death. After his death, Thomas Aquinas' work became part of church doctrine. Clashes between the church and universities would not end, but ultimately, any attempts to stifle natural philosophy were temporary. The universities were here to stay, and the degree of intellectual freedom given to members was great. The church also had a role in this by providing benefices, which were monetary provisions to support scholars affiliated with the church but residing elsewhere. These scholars would occasionally find themselves residing at royal courts or in the university, enabling them to pursue their interests without direct supervision. Ultimately, both the church and universities would be key to the development of science over the next few centuries. We'll see their influence in the next episode, where we look at the science of mechanics in the medieval age. I hope you can join me then. 